and, and thank all of you for showing up uh, for uh, for this little talk here. Uh, I am uh, from uh, the Uni University of California at uh, at Berkeley, and my colleague here is uh, hails from uh, from the same area. And uh, I was fascinated uh, with her area of study. Now, then we, I just want to get a sense here. How many of you actually play video games? Show of hands. That's that's a lot. Sort of. Is that you just just on the weekends? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I would like to call myself a gamer, but I don't think I can anymore. I've come to realize with the rise of esports and just watching any Twitch stream, I cannot hold a candle to the kind of dedication that is out there for a variety of games. But I have, you know, I'm kind of at this point a weekend warrior. You know, if I get a chance, if I, you know, don't have done much work, I'll sit down and I'll play you know, what I can. But it is striking, I was thinking, especially since this, this panel comes together, I was thinking like, how often are my games set in worlds that have just been blasted away, either by, you know, natural disasters, uh, nuclear holocausts, you know, whatever the case is. Why is it so many games are in these desolate uh, spaces? I'm sure maybe it says something about me more than it does the gaming industry. But we have to admit, there is a, certainly a market for these just ruined spaces and the presence of ruins. So I was a bit excited, I gotta say, for, uh, to find out uh, that my, my colleague here, uh, Dr. Emma Frazier, studies games. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what I'm hoping we can focus on here today, is what is with the apocalyptic settings? My initial, I mean, I've got all sorts of thoughts on it. Is it some sort of collective death wish? You know, are we all fixated on our own death and so then we have to think more broadly about, oh, what would, wouldn't it be great if everything fell apart? And then I started thinking, of course, about 2020. And the mixed feelings, of course, we're all of access online, that was kind of apocalyptic, right? Nobody in the streets, you know, I'd go for my jogs and like nobody's around. It really felt like an apocalyptic setting. But then I also thought to myself, I kind of like it. I don't know, is, am I the only one? No, yeah, I might be the only one here. But there was a certain kind of relief. Why? Because the daily grind, everything that happens day in and day out, that stopped. And there was an excuse just to have a moment of reflection. There was an excuse to, you know, to not engage in the, in the daily activity. So uh, there is, I think, something very interesting about the, uh, about the cultural expression of uh, post-apocalypse in, in science fiction, uh, in you know, film, books, and of course, in games. So, while I enjoy these settings, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a closer look at the uh, end of the world and gaming the end of the world with, uh, with, with, Dr., uh, with Dr. Frazier today. And I'd like to open with a bit of a challenge, if I, if I may. Why are games so important that we have entire classes at Cal devoted to them? <laughs> Can you explain that for us? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I'll give a little bit of context on, you know, what is it that I do as well, just, just before we get onto that kind of question of, you know, why are games of the kind of significance that we would even bother, uh, you know, learning about them in a formal kind of education setting. So a lot of the research that I do uh, has been about, you know, ruined spaces in general. So I spent a bit of time, I went to um, Chernobyl and kind of visited that space to try and work out why there's this kind of disaster tourism that people are going to visit there. I spent a lot of time looking at kind of, um, you know, post-industrial cities and the kind of idea that they're empty and post-apocalyptic and this kind of repeated pattern about how, you know, somewhere like Detroit maybe is kind of an end of the world scenario. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this before I came to games. Uh, and then I had this moment where, you know, I have been, as you've described also, I probably did call myself a gamer at some point and then I realised over time that that definition changed and it didn't really apply to me anymore. And so I've, I've kind of bowed out of that and realised that what I do, the kind of practices that I have, are not necessarily the things that we would associate with that kind of gamer uh, name anymore. But I did realise, as, as Ian described, I was playing a lot of games about the end of the world and I'd been spending a lot of time thinking about physical ruins, uh, cities that had been kind of torn apart and things like that in the material world, but, you know, what was going on with games? You know, why on earth was this trope kind of repeating itself? Uh, so I've been researching that for quite a while now. It's kind of my main uh, bread and butter. 
Uh, but in terms of this kind of question of, you know, why are games so important? So I get this question all the time because I run quite a few courses at Berkeley uh, that are focused on different approaches that we can take to understanding games, you know, making games, analysing games, this kind of why should you care question. And the reason I get the question all the time is because students say, my parents want to know why I'm taking this class with you, right? They don't think that this is beneficial. They don't think it's very useful, right? What is the point of this? Um, and so before we kind of get on to the whole end of the world in games thing, uh, you know, games are now the main form of entertainment media that people consume. That's in revenue. It's also in hours. Uh, and those of you who are pretty intensive gamers would know that part of the reason for that is if you don't put 100 plus hours into a game, you probably aren't going to get very far, right? If you really want to finish a game, you want to get all of those challenges. Uh, but the other kind of reason is also that, you know, if you think about the kind of history of media, you think about radio, radio plays, you think about literature, you think about painting, you think about... Uh, film, you know, uh, we've got this whole heritage of kind of apocalyptic visions, but also visions of cities, visions of society, all of these kinds of ways of thinking about the world. Uh, and for a long time, that was static kind of media that we were consuming as pretty passive spectators. Uh, and now a lot of that, if most of the media that we consume a lot of the time are, is interactive and a lot of the time it's games, you know, we really need to start thinking about what those worlds look like. What are we representing? what does it kind of mean and also where does it kind of lead us to right you know that this isn't having a zero impact it's not just something we're doing for fun there's something kind of going on um, in this whole kind of process of becoming uh, consumers of games essentially uh, you mentioned there and something I've been interested in is this the post-apocalypse as, as a setting uh, I was reading something you you had written about it, and I, I mentioned it to you uh, a couple of days ago. There is there should be no such thing as post apocalypse. It's a, it's an oxymoron, yeah. right? What what's after the end? Yeah. yeah. But so there's something built hardwired into it that that tells me that the end is never really the end, uh, and. So why do we keep seeing it? And you know, just you know, we talk about games in particular, but beyond games, why is this such a recurring motif uh, culturally? I mean, I've, I've just off the top of my head created a list here. Uh, 2012, you guys will all know 2012, the movie uh, that was supposed to be the end of the world according to the Mayan calendar. Uh, so they made a movie out of that. Uh, we survived, apparently. War of the Worlds, A Quiet Place, uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still, World War Z, uh, the aptly named Armageddon. Uh, it's, I'm, this is just in, you know, over the course of a decade of, of movies, and, I'm, and I wasn't even taxing my brain. The End, uh, it'll, it'll talk about some, uh, some really, really strong fiction turned into a book, The End by Cormac McCarthy. Uh, so what's up with uh, this trans genre? And, uh, you know, is there something different in games, right? Because we have a lot of this end of the world stuff, this theme going on from, well, you go back to 2000 BC and we're, we've got end of the world narratives going on. W what, is there something different in games? Is there something about games themselves and the experience of it uh, that makes it distinct from these previous iterations of the apocalypse? Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, if we're talking about the end of the world or the apocalypse in games, we're almost never talking about games that are in the lead up to the end of the world, right? They all pretty much take place, you know, Fallout, The Last of Us, Horizon Zero Dawn. There are exceptions, but if, if we think about this as a genre, it's always after the end, right? So this whole concept of the post-apocalyptic, as you describe, um, a guy called James Berger talks about this quite a lot, it's just a real contradiction, right? That we have this kind of cultural symbolism and this figure of the absolute catastrophic, disastrous end of the world, and yet someone always survives, and we always have this kind of story about what would happen after that kind of extreme collapse scenario takes place. Uh, and so, of course, that's not unique to games in a lot of ways. And, and in fact, there's a whole field of study uh, around apocalypse. So it's apocalypse studies or apocalypticism studies uh, that's focused really on understanding this kind of discourse, this whole set of ideas that we would have around the idea that the world ends and then something much more interesting might happen, right? So if you're someone who wants to make a game, 
and you're trying to think of a setting that would be a really useful place that offers up possibility and adventure and a really cool story. Like, the end of the world is it. It's a really great setting for you to select. And so I've interviewed a bunch of game developers about this, and one of the things that they have to say about it is that this kind of possibility of the end of the world is really fruitful if you're trying to design, you know, quests, for example. If you were to set a game in just a regular old city, it would be GTA, because what can you do in a regular old city? You can go and steal cars, you can go and take stuff, but you can't just go and scavenge around for cool stuff, right? If it's the end of the world, hey, everything's open. Like, you can just go break in, you can collect whatever you want, you can stuff it in your backpack, you can keep going, right? So after the end of the world, all of these kind of systems and things like that that are honestly not just a pain to develop for a game, but really kind of impossible uh, for the kind of computational power that we have. You can't really model the real world in a game yet. The end of the world solves all of those problems. It's actually super convenient, right? So what am I going to do uh, in, in an environment that's a bit like where I'm currently, but I can go around and create havoc and shoot stuff and, well, it's going to have to be the end of the world, right? So I think there's a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, you sort of asked, how is this different then to other forms of media, so literature, things like that? So I think I, I got really into the apocalypse, if I have to trace it back. I got really into 1950s kind of science fiction, so things like Day of the Triffids, uh, where there's this kind of empty city and there's usually one person, often a dude, who's cruising around that city and observing very lyrically what does it look like when the world ends, right? This kind of story of collapse. And I think what's different about games is that I'm not reading about or watching something like The Last Man where it's another person doing all of that. You know, I can become that hero. So I get to go and be the hero that survives the end of the world, right? So that's kind of what's different about games is that you then get to be the protagonist when everything else has kind of collapsed. And, and this is, uh, you mentioned you spoke to developers. Yeah. The, and what were the main insights that they offered you, if you haven't, you know, nail yeah. it down? Because that's, I mean, interviews with developers seems like where to go to figure out what's, you know, kind of behind this impulse. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know how many of you, if any, are uh, game developers. I would be very surprised if no one in this room is a game developer. And if you are, uh, one of the things that you would probably know about is the non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> So that means that if I, a researcher, wants to know about how you developed a really cool, fun game that just came out like, I don't know, one of the Fallout games, uh, you probably can't talk to me because you've signed an agreement that says this is all top secret. Or you can talk to me, but I can never say that I spoke to you and I have to generalise uh, what some of the observations were. So I've spoken to quite a few people who have been involved in reasonably big name, what we might call AAA games, uh, that involve things like beautiful vistas of ruins that you can look down upon. You can go to very high places and gaze at the city falling apart uh, and all of that kind of thing. And uh, what they all sort of uniformly pretty much observed when I asked them this question of, okay, why do you have these post-apocalyptic settings in your games, what's the kind of attraction of this? Is it just a really cool gimmick to sell stuff to people, which is obviously part of it? Um, and they all kind of said, well, you know, if you design a game and you have all these pathways that you want people to take, or even if it's an open world game, so a, a kind of vast sort of space that you can move around, uh, you often start to run into trouble where you don't really want people to navigate into certain places, right? So you can design that by having a locked door that maybe people never get through. You can design it by having a brick wall at the end of an alley. But it's really much, much easier if you can stick a bunch of rubble, right? Bits of falling down buildings, right? You can structure pathways so that someone's got to go up a ladder, go, you know, cross a, a, a building that has big holes in the floor, right? It, it, it's sort of a, a natural kind of environment for you to design challenges and all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's what a lot of developers said, is that they actually often started off, you know, they might have had a really interesting story that they want to kind of include in the game about the end of the world, but a lot of it was pragmatic. It was just, it is so much easier to design. You actually use more... Um, sort of, you might put more polygons and things like that in, you might have more complex textures if you've got this kind of end of the world scenario, but, but your kind of levels will be much easier, um, shaping people's kind of trajectories and what you want them to do is much easier. So the end of the world just makes your life much more straightforward in that kind of way if you're a game developer.
I guess that makes sense. I've been thinking about it from the industrial perspective why they would uh, prefer a depopulated area. Yeah. Um, well, let me uh, shift back to the uh, to the, the kind of broader question. Uh, I have my own fascination with the with the with the apocalypse. Uh, I think probably many people do. I can see it out there. I see it in your eyes. I see it in your eyes. Yeah. Um, so it's a common fascination. And I know a lot of film critics uh, and, and just critics in general look back in the 1950s and they see, for instance, you know, uh, the uh, you know stories uh, like the Body Snatchers. Right? We're dealing with, well, again, looking back on it, we're dealing with uh, you know fears of communism. We're, we're dealing with you know Cold War uh, elements, sometimes very clearly, sometimes indirectly or more symbolically. So, uh, you know, I wonder what you think about applying a similar kind of, uh, maybe it's just kind of historicism, like, well, what were the main concerns? And that must be in the film. But do we see that going on with, with games? It, would it be fair to say, look at all these games, look at all the post-apocalypse, what is that saying about the preoccupations of this age? Yeah, yeah. so I think it's really, really difficult with games. So, um, again, you know, I don't know how many of you have read much of this stuff before, uh, but one of the kind of ideas about games for a long time was that uh, you can't really analyse them in the way that you can analyse something like literature or film because their stories aren't complicated enough, because there isn't enough going on, because they're kind of shallow or basic, right? So this for a long time was the sort of received wisdom about games. Uh, and so when you ask this kind of question of, okay, I could go and analyse, you know, a film from 1975 and think about the Cold War, can I go and do that with a game from 2020 and think about, you know, COVID, well, probably not COVID, but something that was happening in maybe 2017 or 2018, because it takes a long time to develop a lot of um, games. Uh, and I would say that you can't translate that kind of analysis that you would do straightforwardly to a game. Um, but the reason for that is that games are actually, in a lot of ways, a much more complicated kind of text, right? So you have to think about not just who the characters are and what the story is and where the story is set, but also, you know, you move through that story, particularly if you've got a game where you're an avatar and you're moving around, so the landscape in many ways is kind of a character, right? the kind of mechanics that you have in the game, the kind of choices that you have for what you can do in the space that you're given, that's kind of part of the analysis that you need to do. The rules, if there are rules, the systems that kind of uphold that game, you need to analyse all of that, which makes it really difficult to straightforwardly say, well, this game's about the end of the world, so Fallout, for example, as a series, um, you know, they really cite a lot of the 1950s kind of fear of nuclear war and, and that's a lot of what they're about, that's what the aesthetic is about, but there is so much more in that game that I think can tell us, so Fallout 3, for example, can tell us a lot about what we think about, uh, you know, cities and monuments and things like that. If you're cruising around in Washington and Washington has been kind of rendered as this really ruinous kind of space, like you will never see Washington the same way ever again, right? And I'm not saying that doesn't happen if you read a book where Washington's been ruined in some way or you watch Independence Day or any one of those many, many films where you see the capital getting kind of blown up. But actually going there, moving around that space, moving your avatar, it makes for a profoundly different experience. So if we want to think about what those uh, kind of underlying symbolism might be, uh, how we can analyse a game for our own kind of current in anxieties, I think you've really got to start to ask, OK, who are the enemies, for example, that you're supposed to fight? Uh, what are they doing? They, they stand for a very different kind of... Uh, part of the story than they would in a, in a film or they would in a piece of literature um, because, you know, once you kill them, their, their body disappears, right, from the story. You've got... There's a whole range of other things going on. Um, so, you know, I've thought about this obviously a lot and I would have a lot to say about the different kinds of analysis that we can do. Um, but I think one of the things that you do see repeated quite a lot uh, is the kind of zombie trope. Uh, which I think tells us a lot about our fears ar around things like pandemics, uh, around things like, um, you know, the way in which we ourselves might actually feel uh, out of control or not able to make choices in our lives, right? There's always this kind of character that is, is you know, beyond themselves, that isn't really able to um, sort of 
function in a normal human way and you've got to destroy them in some kind of way. I think that's really interesting that that comes back again and again. And in con conjunction with that, you see a lot of uh, themes in post-apocalyptic games around technology. So either sort of hyper-technical, so something like Horizon Zero Dawn, where you, you wear the focus and things like that. So you've got these kind of technical systems. You become a kind of cyborg or the, the Pip-Boy in Fallout. Uh, or you look at something like The Last of Us, and I think that's such a beautiful example of this almost like imagining what it would be like if the world just returned to nature and we could have this rural kind of environment where no one has a cell phone, right? I don't have to worry about this anymore. I'm just out dealing with the zombies and that's, you know, my life, right? So I think a lot of the time you'll see these, these kind of anxieties are the things that stress us out and we worry about and then they kind of appear... Um, in games in that way. Uh, and the other thing that I think is really profoundly different from maybe the communist kind of threat or some of the, the sort of apocalyptic tales around uh, nuclear war um, is really the, the kind of spectre of 9-11. So you see a lot of games, something like Death Stranding, a lot of the ruins in Death Stranding actually look like the, the ruins from 9-11, for example. So I think that's a kind of inevitable part in the war on terror uh, and the military kind of um, implications there kind of crop up a lot in the post-apocalyptic visions that you have in games, very different to, to other media and other forms. Death Stranding, anybody, has anybody played Death Stranding? I got a show of hands, anyone? Oh, it's, that, that makes me sad. <laughs> that makes me really sad. Uh, pretty good game, I got to say, pretty good game. Um, it's a little slow because you're, the, as a character, your main task is to deliver the mail. Yeah. But it's in a post-apocalyptic setting, so it's cool, and you know there's a lot of jazz to it. But the, you know, th what's interesting about that game, and I don't know if, if you feel this way, but th there is yes, like craters. There is you know some sort of event that took place. It's ambiguously described as it so often is in post-apocalyptic settings. Um, but the main task, as you're delivering the mail, you're you know like a glorified UPS person. Your task is to reforge the social bonds that that were frayed by this cataclysmic event, where what you're what you're really concerned about is like getting people their stuff so that you re-earn their trust and connect and reconnect. Which, of course, for me is less about a, a you know a physical you know destruction of infrastructure that we often see represented, and it's more I, th I think a, a pretty good commentary on our, our, our current state of uh, alone together, a, a, as it were, right? We, you know, I don't know how many times we, I've walked into a room and it's like four people together, but they're all just staring in their phones, not interacting, right? So it's the cliche, but, but there is something to it. Plus, we're going through times of uh, pretty intense partisan uh, environment. So it, I don't know, I, when I look at it, some, it, I, it's, it's a sophisticated game. Uh, and I would say it's an excellent medium for communicating, if not, you know, uh, well, anxieties of the time. Uh, it's social commentary in the guise of a post-apocalyptic world when the real apocalypse is this symbolic one that's going on between us where places like this and moments of connection uh, are fewer and, and, and far between. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, of course, my interpretation of, of Death Stranding. Yeah. And nobody else can share that with me. Uh, <laughs> go out and get it. Uh, it's, it's worth buying, I think. Yeah, and I mean, so I think it, it's kind of interesting, um, one of the big critiques, right, of an end-of-the-world scenario is that it's this really kind of bad-taste spectacle, right, particularly with games, that if you want to go out and play the end of the world, there's partly there's something a bit wrong with you, right, that that's just kind of grim and it's depressing, but also that it's not critical, right, that it's the stuff that big blockbuster Hollywood films are kind of made of, uh, and, and that there couldn't be anything profound or meaningful about it. And so I think what one of the things that we're seeing is, uh, particularly in something like Death Stranding, but there are other, other games. I think The Last of Us Part Two tried to do this, and if someone wants to fight me after, I can tell you why they failed, but I won't, I won't regale you with that now. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting example, as you know, on this kind of social bonds question, and also to go back to your other question about um, kind of analysis of literature and things like that, this potential for games, which I think for anyone who, who plays games a lot and is really into it, this shouldn't be news to you, but they actually have a lot of potential to, for example, uh, be really critical dystopian pieces of work, um, get people to think about, you know, social and cultural questions, 
Uh, but for a long time, the default kind of idea is that games are fun, games are kind of meaningless, they're a bit of a waste of time, you know, they're maybe not about anything. Um, and so I think that kind of element of Death Stranding and, and the combination of the, the kind of existential crisis sort of setting, uh, you know, makes for something that is really actually a very compelling piece of media uh, that, that I think stands against any kind of argument that someone has that games are all kind of by default just essentially a bit of a waste of time, which is a really common kind of discourse that, that we have. I had a, I was reading an interview with somebody from uh, forgive the expression here Kill Screen was the was the name um, from of the site but it was an interview at, at Fast Company and this uh, editor at Kill Screen which does a lot of commentary on games and they were asking about Apocalypse uh, and the role of Apocalypse in gaming and this um, this commentary from Kill Screen went something like this I want to get your response to it uh, quote ruins uh, most commonly represent the decay of the former civilization's values, and the pleasure of such texts comes from the opportunity to glimpse into the past from a position of moral superiority, often through hindsight. Uh, how do you respond to that? Because I'm, I'm wondering about the, you know, how history is used in games and through ruins. Uh, would you agree, disagree? How do you feel? Yeah, so... Yeah, so that's an, I haven't, we haven't pre-prepared this. This is a new one to me. It's really interesting. Uh, so, so one of the other things that I would kind of describe that I do is that um, if I really wanted to formalise it, I'm a, like a ruinologist, right? So there's another one of those fields that we have where you basically study particularly like contemporary ruins. So not ancient ruins, not, you know, classical kind of Greek ruins or anything like that, but uh, the ruins of a recent past. And... In that field, uh, a bit like games actually, there's this whole default kind of understanding of this is what a ruin is, this is what a ruin does, uh, this is how we interpret it. They're all kind of cliched, they're all really trite and basic and, um, you know, kind of cheap almost in a way as a, as a, as a figure that you might use. Um, and so what that kind of quote makes me think about is, is all of these default... Uh, kind of understandings that we have about ruins and a ruined city, right? So if I, if I sort of say ruined city, like I'm, I know that you all have, I mean, it helps that we've got pictures up here, but you all have images in your mind and some of them will be images of things that have happened recently, particularly in Ukraine, for example. So if I gave this talk a year ago, it would be a very different set of images. But a lot of them are, yeah, classical ruins of Rome, for example. Um, maybe even you'd think of something like the pyramids as being a form of a ruin. Uh, you know, you would have certain figures um, in mind. And it's considered to be almost kind of bad taste art if you were to produce images of ruin. Because the default kind of message that they give is really this, this basic idea of, yeah, we are the elite. We are looking back upon a failed civilization. We have essentially won in some kind of way. Uh, and and also that the kind of idea that a ruin has is a piece of architecture that's returned to nature, right, in its most basic kind of definition. Uh, that idea of the world being reclaimed by nature is considered in, in kind of elite circles uh, to be, yeah, cliched, kind of pointless. Um, and so I think it's really interesting that, that we take both video games and ruins and the end of the world and we trash all of these things and we say that, all actually really basic and they're all kind of so full of like meaning and 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 uh, potential kind of interpretation that actually they they don't mean anything at all right which just seems like a peculiar claim to me uh, but also I think tells you a lot about uh, the the way that we understand the end of the world in the first place right that it isn't actually genuinely political that it isn't something that we should take seriously which seems extra weird when we're now facing climate change. Like, I just spent summer in Australia, right? So you may remember in early 2020, everything was burning down, some Australian. Like, those fires, I mean, you know, colossal in scale, you know, a lot of loss of property. property. All, all winter, when I was in Australia, it was flooding. You know, worst floods that they've ever had, worst floods on record. They'd break a record and then two months later another flood's coming. They're expecting all of this to happen over summer. You know, we're really in this period of extreme climate change where ruins will be a whole part of the future and we're still saying that ruins are, you know, the world returning to nature and otherwise a bit trite. And also those other people in the past had ruins but we will somehow endure. Like, that's what those they do when they make a mistake, right? That we can somehow rise above that. 
Um, so I find all of that a very interesting kind of set of, of probably lies that we're telling ourselves, frankly. Um, and games are kind of fun to explore that also. Yeah, I, I really had a, uh, I had some issues with the idea of ruins being a way to elevate ourselves. I think that certainly goes on. But at the same time, in a lot of games, you look at the past as some sort of golden period that you're trying to restore. And it seems like that's, you know, that provides the engine, f um, uh, at least an, as an aesthetic setting. Uh, because you're, what you're doing is as a, as a character, you're going in and you have a world that is broken in some way. And that's the challenge, is for you to reassemble uh, what was what was broken or restore what was, so I think there certainly is a, you know ruins can be more than one thing clearly in in games but um, but it, but in this case um, that that sort of perspective when we encounter uh, beyond games but certainly culturally when we look back uh, at, at at cultures that are broken and we have these fragments uh, I think there is an, an impulse to uh, restore more than uh, just to lie, you know, be like, ha we're alive and you're not. <laughs> we win, right? Yeah. I think there certainly is a combination of, of both this, uh, in, this impulse to rescue the past. And this is, you know, and you guys will have to forgive me uh, for my uh, 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 pretensions here, but this is something that was very common with the, the French playwrights, right? When they discovered the, you know, Aristotle, they looked at it and they're like, oh, here's how to write the perfect play. And then anyone who didn't write like that, like the ancient Greeks, you know, 17, you know, you know, 2,000 years ago, they got it right. And that was it. And a lot of philosophers do the same thing. They look at the Greeks and they say, like, well, they had it right. So there is this uh, both, I think, an impulse uh, to look at the past and say, we're better than that. And also, oh, look, that's what we have to live up to, depending on the culture that's yeah. being observed, of course. Yeah. Um, but you know, I guess we're, we're stepping a little bit away from uh, from games. But th that you know, fundamentally, we're supposed to interact with the with the world uh, and restore what was what is what is broken. Now, is that mechanic uh, involved in the choice of uh, the post-apocalypse, or is that just something that we're always going to see in, in games because it's fundamental to what it means to play a game? Yeah, th and that's a really pertinent question. For, so this image um, here is the most recent Kirby game, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. And I think this is a really perfect image for this question on restoration because the thing that is really interesting and really notable about this game is so s a lot of you have probably played a Kirby game. They're normally cute, they're normally fun. This is all of those things, but it is set in the ruins of our world, uh, I think. So there's a shopping mall, there's uh, a kind of um, fairground, there's... I mean, there are so many different kind of settings. that you're, there's, there's a kind of downtown wilderness, I think is what it's called. Um, and the thing about this is that it's, you know, it's a Japanese game by an entirely Japanese uh, development team. And Japan doesn't kind of share precisely the same Western sensibility around ruination and the end of the world. Uh, of course, you know, Japan consumes plenty of Western media, but some element um, of, of the Japanese kind of sentiment around ruins is that you know, things ought to be kind of left as they are and, and to kind of fall apart. Um, so Japan is kind of quite known, for example, for rebuilding houses all the time, right? So you have a house, maybe it lasts for 30, 40, 50 years, you demolish it, you build another one. Um, so there's a whole kind of idea that ruins are just kind of these things that are part of life and they can just sit around and that's cool in some respects, depending on where you are and, and all of those sorts of things. And so what happens in this game is that it's one of the few games you're not trying to restore this world at all. You're actually just cruising around in it smashing it up and, and kind of interacting with it in different ways, but you don't know why there are no people there. The story is kind of never told to you. You're just doing the usual Kirby thing of saving your friends and stuff. It just happens to be like a ruin, uh, but there's no restoration. And, and what's interesting about that is that I think it tells you something about why this restoring um, kind of messaging repeats itself within the kind of apocalyptic narratives that we have in games because it's a huge part of the Western kind of framing of history, right? So that you may learn a different kind of history in different contexts, but a lot of the time we think about history as being a kind of march from one period, right, to the next, moving on, progressing, getting better over time, you know, the rise and fall of civilizations. This is kind of what we think. Uh, and so when you see a lot of games, they're really dealing with that kind of idea that you're either uh, in a moment where progress has kind of stopped, right? That the apocalypse or the post-apocalypse is that moment where it's the end of history. 
uh, or the idea that you have to keep progressing somehow. So the world has ended, but now you have to keep history going. So you are that singular person or singular group of people who will kind of keep the flame alive, essentially. And so a huge part of that then is, is this notion of reconstruction. Um, and I'm always kind of uh, alert to this as being a very heavily kind of ideological way of thinking, because actually if you look at something like the National Socialists and Nazis in, in Germany and Berlin, a whole part of what they were doing was this idea of restoring the empire. So bringing back um, a German empire that never existed and building a, a lot of the materials that they were kind of working on, the architecture that they built, they built it in such a way, you know, Albert Speer kind of famously, although probably he was not telling the truth, claimed that, that a lot of what they were doing was trying to build um, the ruins of the future, essentially, right? Because this whole idea is that if you are a great civilization, you will leave ruins uh, behind you that are, that are really exceptional and that people will look back on um, and then there'll be a greater civilization that comes after, right? So that's kind of what you see repeated again and again in games because that's the apocalyptic vision that we kind of have, um, which is also quite useful. So this image here uh, is a piece of uh, cover art or concept art from a game called Hellgate London. Um, not a particularly successful game that was made by the original team who made the first Diablo game. Uh, and they had this really brilliant vision for um, a really great MMO and nobody had the hardware to run it because it was this very, very good game well ahead of its time. Um, but one of the things that they did was kind of go back to a lot of the ways of thinking about London in ruins, which happened um, during particularly the kind of colonial period when uh, people are going out from the British Empire colonising places like Australia and New Zealand and thinking about, um, you know, what are our ruins going to look like when Britain is eventually conquered? Um, and so they were really playing with that kind of idea. So there's this image and there's another one um, coming up after this, which is actually um, there, are, there are etchings and things like that that they actually are playing off. They're building in, in this kind of whole idea of the, the sort of ruin progress history apocalypse uh, kind of set of, of frames. Um, and, and, and playing a little bit, I think, here as well with the biblical kind of idea of apocalypse too. Could you, could you I, I recall you mentioning that this, uh, is this the image, I'm, oh, I should have my glasses on, is this the image from, no, this is, uh, this is not the image that was No, there's, uh, there's another Hellgate. couple coming that we'll get to. Oh, well, yeah, it comes up in some minutes. In the meantime, um, I was. Uh, I would also like you to respond, if you will, to the what, just something I get as a as a gamer whenever I experience uh, ruins. When I when I'm looking at ruins and I see it, it gives me a sense of of kind of deep time, and there is a certain amount of insignificance that I feel in the face of this. You know, this kind of you know deeper than. Um, you know, just a, a, a contemporary history. We're talking about histories that have been lost and rediscovered. And that uh, kind of puts me, it humbles me uh, to a certain degree and also incites an element of, of wonder. Uh, is that something that uh, is happening in games or are they aiming for that? Because it seems like it's not happening whenever they, you see, for instance, Washington in ruins, you know, the, like the Washington Mall or, or Congress. Like that's, that's you know, too contemporary. Uh, but it does frame it as uh, as a ruin. But in other cases, we do seem to look at ruins as this very ex experience of, of deep time where we are nothing. Uh, is that playing into the use of this post-apocalyptic setting or ruins in general? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I think uh, there, are, there are people who have done a lot of research on this who would claim that the most, what they say, aestheticized object uh, is the ruin ever kind of in the visual history of all of human kind of media production. Uh, and, and a lot of that is to do with this kind of idea uh, of the ruin gaze. So quite timely here, uh, we can see this image here, uh, which is also from Hellgate London, of a figure kind of looking out across the ruins of London, looking at St Paul's Cathedral uh, as a ruin. Uh, and there's a piece of artwork that comes after this, which is um, Gustave Doré's etching uh, of the New Zealander, which is uh, a citation of, of a poem, uh, I think it's a Shelley poem, I should know but I don't remember, uh, basically about this idea of someday someone from New Zealand will come and look upon the ruins um, of London as we have looked upon the ruins of the places where we've gone 
uh, and kind of conquered. And so there, there's a whole kind of theoretical framing around this notion that we have something called the ruin gaze um, and we have this sense of the sublime of uh, something that is bigger than us and that the, the kind of apocalypse and especially this kind of symbolic framing of the, the vast ruined city that this repeated trope that just gets picked up and dropped into so many different kind of contexts, uh, that that really feeds into this idea of, you know, human time uh, does not particularly track with the, you know, what we might think of as the time of nature, um, so that the natural world works on, you know, trees might take hundreds of years to grow, um, a natural environment might take, you know, many, many centuries to develop. Uh, if you start to talk about geomorphology and things like that, we're looking at millennia. Uh, and so humans are these tiny little insignificant kind of specks. Uh, and so a ruin, and, and especially a ruin at scale, so a, a kind of apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic city, uh, does all of that kind of work of making us feel small and insignificant by almost giving us a snapshot of that decay, that decline, that um, eons long temporality, right? And, and part of that, I think, has a lot to do with the framing, again, that we have around what is historic and what, what our experience of time is. Um, but also when you live in a very contemporary kind of present where everything is updated, you know, all the time, constantly, not just in terms of disposability, but in terms of the urban fabric, in terms of just the pace of change, that that kind of sense of the static still moment that, that doesn't constantly transform, um, that speaks of that stasis, I, th I think, um, is, is kind of what the ruin is useful for. And, and, you know, we can kind of see, comparing those two images as well, this, this quite um, kind of established long-term way of thinking as well, particularly, you know, after industrial modernity as well. And the premise here is that this is a New Zealander who's yes. coming back to, to look at a fallen central empire or the, the centre of the empire. Okay, I'm going to throw you another another loop here, and then after uh, after I ask this question, I'm going to I want to turn to you guys to see if you guys have anything you want to ask our resident expert here on. on so on you, the you should think of good questions, and they can be they can be they don't have to be kind questions. You can also ask like mean questions because I also like those. So She's spoiling for a go fight. Go for it. Watch out. Yeah. Um, ARGs, uh, augmented uh, reality games. Uh, I read a very interesting interpretation of QAnon as a, a form of an augmented reality game, which is when you live in the world, uh, but there are certain elements of the world that are changed uh, and you essentially participate in an augmented reality. And QAnon, if for those of you who don't know, uh, is a series of riddles for, from 2017 through about, well, 2020, uh, that were thrown out uh, on, on social media and they were very uh, cryptic messages that legions of Trump fans uh, would interpret and extrapolate on, a lot like you know uh, someone a biblical scholar might uh, looking at you know, biblical texts and interpreting it in this mystical way. And so a lot of people looked at that, especially the relationship between the person that was uh, posting as QAnon or persons, there might have been several people doing it, and the, the following that was there and the, and the sort of um, uh, game that essentially emerged from doing this like numerology and this, and this decoding of, 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 of the riddle. Now, is there, in terms of the uh, apocalypse and games, do you see some sort of connection? And again, taking it out of games in the video sense, in the in technological sense, and looking at augmented reality games and how games might structure our reality in such a way as to... Uh, perhaps re-elect President Trump? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a huge, huge question. Um, I think the short answer is that there is no, just, just to clear this up, there is no scientifically, behaviourally proven causal relationship between I'm going to play this game and then I'm going to go out and do a thing, right? So you don't play Call of Duty and go and shoot people. You don't, uh, you know, play games and become a QAnon person who then maybe goes and, and, and harms someone as well. Uh, but I think there is something to be said for a, a wider kind of digital context in which, you know, if, if we have a way of thinking about the world 
that is increasingly predicated upon this idea that we take as a common sense kind of idea that you can get lost online, that you can get so addicted to a game that maybe we think you wouldn't know right from wrong or you wouldn't know the the, the real from the, the kind of fake, um, that, you know, maybe if we consume enough uh, media that doesn't give us a kind of factual perspective, that we could get kind of trapped in a, in a different way of thinking. And we see this playing out again and again. So a lot of the conversation about the metaverse at the moment is, is kind of centred on this notion that maybe our lives are so terrible that we would all prefer going online and living in another world, right? So we have this very dominant kind of idea that um, the online world, the digital world, the video game world is some other kind of reality that we are living in. Um, and so I think my position on that, and this includes the, the kind of post-apocalyptic spaces that are very, um, you know, spectacularized and imaginative uh, and that sort of things, that they are actually a branch of our real world. It's not as if um, they're, they're not kind of part, it's not like you switch off who you are and your habits and your tastes and your interests the minute you go uh, online playing a game. So um, that said, there is obviously a link uh, with something like um, far-right kind of political action and radicalization uh, and and parts of the gaming community. Um, but I think that that has a lot more to do with uh, notions that we have around um, games culture, digital culture, what was kind of promised, right? That that digital culture, if you're someone who's kind of above 35-ish probably, you would have grown up thinking that the internet is going to make the world a utopia and it's going to be really, really awesome. And that's kind of never happened. And so th I think you get a lot of this dissatisfaction with the prediction that the world's going to get better when we can all jet off into the virtual. Um, but actually the best thing we can do is kind of go around play the end of the world, imagine what it's like to be the survivor who's the hero who kind of gets to to make it through the end of the day um, and, and it probably doesn't get better than that. And so, yeah, I would always be cautious about, you know, QAnon's an online thing, but it also comes from, you know, our everyday kind of lives as well. Um, so, you know, games are just one kind of element of that um, and radicalization is is not... You know, you can't just play Fallout 3 and, and become kind of suddenly you want to go and start a nuclear war, right? It doesn't, luckily for us, uh, it doesn't really work that way. So. Yeah, good clarification. That's, uh, um, all right. Uh, well, I do want to uh, open it up to anyone who has uh, questions about the gaming industry or, um, uh, or uh, games. I'd like to hear, frankly, if you play uh, games that have a, uh, in a, a post-apocalyptic setting, because uh, I'm taking notes and always interested in, uh, in uh, exploring those games. Anyone? Thank you. Um, so I have kind of a opposite question of the post-apocalyptic, but like games, like world building games, but specifically I feel like there's a synergy with people who play maybe like they want to be the savior in a post-apocalyptic apocalyptic world but they go to world building and then maybe like destroy things right so I'm kind of curious how you see like that um, those different types of games and maybe different types of behaviors within games yeah so so there's quite a few people who have done um, what we can think of as, as being kind of player typologies where you basically uh, watch a lot of different people play video games and try to work out what do they get out of it what kind of play are they engaging in and what is it that they're doing? Um, and, and actually what you've identified there is that there is a whole kind of uh, play style which is essentially the destructive player or the, or the chaos causing player. Uh, so there's a, there's a study, um, I think it's T.L. Taylor, it might be somebody else, uh, on The Sims and looking at what different play types there are in The Sims and there is a whole category of person who plays The Sims who likes to build up a house, get everyone into the house, kill everyone in the house, have a whole bunch of graves out the back, um, you know, and kind of essentially destroy the kinship and the social kind of environment. Uh, and, that, and there are also a whole range of games that are based on this idea of just go out and smash stuff up, cause chaos. Um, and there, there are also patterns of play where you may have a quite open world game 
and there's a lot of different things you could choose to do and you just you choose to uh, maybe grief people or go around and actually destroy someone's fun MMO that they're doing online and like ruin their little world that they've built which I think people will also do um, so yeah there's absolutely a player type that is the destructive player um, you know I, I always have a bit of caution about these typologies because you can't just fit everyone in a box but it's most people who've done a study on play types has, have found this kind of person who likes to go into um, world building spaces and just create a disaster essentially, yeah. So. Yeah, um, I was curious uh, what your thoughts were on how the medium of video games might affect uh, the storyline or perhaps even constrain the stories to kind of be optimistic in a sense because since it's an active interactive experience the player might expect to just win at the end I, I think you're kind of limited in a video game medium versus just watching a movie maybe the, the protagonist loses but I don't know do you have any uh, insight on that yeah, yeah, so exactly right. So if you want to sell a game that is successful, there has to be a win condition. You can't sell... People have tried to make games that are basically, you know, you can't win at this game, fail at this game, that's the point of the game. Uh, and they're fun artefacts and they're kind of amusing, but they're not really... One of the questions is, are they games? So if you can't win, is it a game, right? What, what makes it a game? Uh, but it really does have an impact... Uh, on the narrative and in, in fact until relatively recently um, you know a lot of the really early games they didn't really have a narrative right the first Super Mario kind of um, situation is, is Donkey Kong and he's not even Super Mario at that point he's um, oh, he's jump guy jump man uh, and he just picks up the princess and gets her at the top of the ladder like you can't really have a story there you would have to put loads of text at the beginning you'd have to merge it maybe with a text-based game um, so, you know, there are a lot of constraints. Designing a game uh, that is kind of meaning plus play together is, is profoundly difficult. So the people, again, if anyone here who's a game designer would kind of know that the holy grail of, of if you're doing especially an RPG that people are supposed to play for hours and hours, um, you know, you've, you've done your best kind of job in that. If the storyline is so integrated and seamless with the play and with the requirements of play that you can kind of do both at once, because uh, most games, a lot of it's cutscenes and things like that, or filler kind of moments where half the players are like, I just want to play that game. Um, so there is this really complicated question about games. You know, what can they do with narrative? Can games really have narrative in the sort of sense that we would recognise it um, or not? And the, this is like a really aggressive fight that goes on in academic circles, which often my students say, this isn't, uh, this isn't an argument. I've played whatever my favourite game is, and of course it has a narrative, and it's a great narrative, and I'm really into it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not the same as, as other forms of media, though. So it is, a, it is a really complicated thing to do, and it takes a lot of time to do it right. I think we had, we had one over here in the corner that's been waiting patiently. Um, so you're obviously somewhat of an expert on video games in general, and I imagine that means you play at least a good amount of a good number of them. Um, what are your favorite games to recommend to people? And I would say specifically two games. One is, what do you recommend to like the casual gamer who played like Candy Crush when it was popular? Or what do you recommend to you know someone who has logged hundreds of hours in all the games that you've listed, you know, the AAA games that you've listed today? Yeah, so so providing that we're just talking across like most of most of time, or at least not now, not currently. Um, so a, a game that is really beautiful, I think, for for casual gamers, um, it, it's kind of quite an old game. I think it came out in 2014. Um, I was actually just talking about this today. Is a game called Monument Valley. Um, yeah, right. It's a real, it's a really great game, and it's a game that kind of plays with the idea of what is a game. Um, so, so the idea is that it's sort of an Escher-like maze that you have to navigate through, but it really acknowledges the fact that it's a flat screen. You're not really in a dimensional space, so it's like puzzles. Um, but it's got a really beautiful atmosphere, and I think it, it's it does everything that a really simple game um, should be able to do. So that's quite that's quite beautiful um, as a game. Um, and in terms of a game that I think anyone who's a, who's a really serious, like, hardcore gamer should play, that I feel like is, is this really undervalued game, um, is actually a game 
uh, I think the first one came out probably on PS1, but it might have been PS2. Uh, but the second one is the best one. It's a game called State of Emergency, which is essentially a game where um, you have to you have to go around in different urban environments and shopping malls and things and just pick up weapons and destroy things. So it sounds very antisocial. It sounds kind of like a, a bit like a destructive game, actually. Um, but it's just one of those games that's just infinitely playable, really beautifully designed, didn't do particularly well at the time, and actually does have this interesting combination of very basic, smashy kind of gameplay that could appeal to anyone, but does have a kind of underlying message. Um, so that, that would be the one that I would say for the kind of hardcore, very into their games. You know, go and get State of Emergency on an emulator or something and, and play that um, and have a really fun time and think about it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I we think have we have time for one more. Yeah. yeah. Whoever, did you want to take uh, it? Well, most enthusiastic person, are we going <laughs> to... You have to choose. I'm not going to choose it. No, I, me, me, me. I got to give it to me. <laughs> My question is about um, gaming and the autistic community and, and neurodevelopment in children. I worked with some autistic kids, and we played, um, if you know the game, the Goose Game. Yes, Untitled and Goose so, Game. Yeah, yeah, Untitled Goose Game. So it's very in sort of that chaos kind of thing. But when you're using it as a teaching tool and you're playing next to someone and, and there is that social component where you're learning and bonding over that, like something different is happening. So I just wanted to know if you would chime in because autism and neurodevelopment and is yeah. a big thing in the gaming community. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've just been um, looking at some of the readings that I'm going to add in for students um, for my upcoming course. And one of the things that I came across is a study on neurodivergent children and play. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually really, really interesting, the sort of research that's happening at the moment, because um, particularly collective play and particularly for people who might be nonverbal or really struggle socially, games are this incredibly powerful kind of sharing environment uh, that allow forms of expression that can be non-verbal or non-textual that are gestural, for example. So looking at things like um, VR movement and those sorts of things. Uh, so yeah, I think absolutely there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be done uh, on the kind of potential for games. You know, there's a lot of research on play itself, right? Children's play, play with toys and things like that as a way to, um, you know, uh, communicate with neurodivergent people, but there's games have been dismissed for so long as just being kind of non-educational that I feel like there's been um, a bit missed a trick a little bit, right? Um, so, so yeah, absolutely. I think an Untitled Goose Game is such a fun one as well. Um, so again, if you haven't played it, you should get Untitled Goose Game. Um, it's quite a fun story, mostly academics who just thought they would try to make a game. And now I know some of these academics; they have a lot of money. Uh, it's a very <laughs> successful game, um, but a really, a really good game for someone who's never gamed before because it just asks you to figure it out. Right? You don't know what the rules are. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and very sort of socially aware, right, uh, about what the environment might be in a, in a, in a sort of um, domestic space and all of those sorts of things too. So, yeah, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's a, you know, future, really interesting future direction of research as well. So, thanks. Well, I think I understand why there's courses on games now. Uh, so, Dr. Emma Frazier, thank you very much for giving us your time. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, everyone. Let's give them another round of applause. I never knew that you could take courses about video games, so this was very, yeah, I'm like, I need to send this to my brother who loves playing video games, yeah, so yeah, he. Uh, just very quickly, I did a, a mid-semester um, feedback from my students a couple of years ago, uh, and they, one of the things they said